Good morning, Zion. You belong here. We belong together. I'm Pastor Dwayne Jesse, pastor at Zion Lutheran Church in Youngstown, Ohio, and today we are celebrating the second Sunday after Pentecost. Zion Lutheran Church is hosting live in-person corporate worship, and I want you to feel welcome to join us at either our blended service on Saturday at 5 p.m. or our traditional Lutheran liturgical service on Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. Guess what? Worshippers at our live corporate worship services no longer have to wear masks as long as they are fully vaccinated. And we can sing. Worship is not completely back to the way it was pre-pandemic, but we're getting ever closer. Please note that all this good news is subject to change due to the guidance of public health officials. This coming Saturday, the Northeastern Ohio Synod will be in assembly, and Judy Heisler and I will be your delegates, along with the other business of the Synod. At the conclusion of the Synod Assembly on Saturday, Bishop Laura Barbins, whom you all had a chance to meet a couple of weeks ago, will be installed. Please keep our Synod, its delegates, and our new bishop in your prayers. I want to thank you for your continued financial faithfulness. Zion is still a vital part of our community thanks to your regular contributions. The special ministry emphasis for the month of June is Camp Frederick and Zion's debt reduction. To make a special offering or co to contribute your regular tithes and offerings, I suggest to use the website zionohio.org and click on the Give tab. You can also use the Give Plus smartphone app, and you can reach us by the U.S. mail. Assisting in worship today are Joan Gent, our Administrator of Worship and Music on the keyboards. Michelle Vargo will be leading us in our singing and providing special music. Alexa Vargo will be leading us in our prayers of intercession. Kari Wentz, our Administrator of Communications, produced the video. Eric Vargo edited the video and Stephanie Chismar edited the music. Now, I invite you to sing along to our gathering song. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. All-powerful God, in Jesus Christ you turn death into life and defeat into victory. Increase our faith and trust in him that we may triumph over all evil in the strength of the same Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from 2 Corinthians. St. Paul writes, Just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we speak, 
because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus went home, and the crowd came together again, so that Jesus and the disciples could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself, and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness. But for they said, for they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, said, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The Gospel of the Lord. During the month of June, I will be preaching a short sermon series based on the readings from 2 Corinthians. Along the way, I intend to teach you a little bit about the Apostle Paul, the author of the two letters to the Corinthians, Corinth, the city and its people, some surprising theories about the two letters that are in the New Testament, and some of the issues that Paul faced with the Corinthian fellowship. So let's get started. Paul was a passionate man given to a wide range of emotions. He had genuine heartfelt affection for the Corinthian people that made up the fellowship he founded. We observe his anger and distress in his letters to the Corinthians. Perhaps this is because he founded the fellowship in Corinth and had a lot of skin in the game, so to speak. But we will learn that the feeling of affection was not always mutual. Oh, the Corinthians loved and appreciated the man who brought them faith in Jesus Christ. But Paul was demanding and insistent and behaved with them as if he was their master at times, and that made the people resentful. The city of Corinth was prominent in the first century. It was located in Greece on an isthmus between the Aegean and Ionian seas, which guaranteed its importance both militarily and commercially. Corinth was the capital city of the Roman province, Achaia, 
It was a prosperous city, but also known for its immorality. Because of Corinth's sordid reputation, a new Greek word was coined, Corinthiazomai, which meant to live immorally as a Corinthian. You didn't want that said about you. So imagine a wealthy pagan population whom Paul preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to with all the passion that Paul was known for and having enough success in the community to establish a house church. Now don't be thinking of Zion. Think of several, maybe up to 50 people who gathered regularly to hear Paul and his associates preach and teach and lead worship. Well, we all know that there are two letters addressed to the Corinthians in the canon of Scripture. The dates of the letters can be only estimated in general terms. Nevertheless, Bible scholars estimate that 1 Corinthians was written by Paul from Ephesus in the fall or winter of 53 or 54 CE, or approximately 20 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now, what I'm about to say to you might just blow your mind. We all know that there are just two letters in the Bible written by Paul to the Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. However, Bible scholars believe that though the letters generally seem to be assembled in chronological order, what we actually have is a collection of fragments of perhaps five letters that ancient scholars put together into two letters that we know as 1st and 2nd Corinthians. How could this happen? Allow me to offer a scenario. Bible scholars believe that Paul wrote perhaps five letters. The single editions of each of these letters were likely written on some ancient, non-durable material like papyrus that simply did not survive and in time broke into pieces called fragments. The fact is, the oldest documents that exist that are attributed to the Apostle Paul are dated to be from 175 to 250 CE, meaning long after Paul had died. How can this be, you ask? Well, first of all, it is unlikely that Paul's hand wrote any of his letters. Writing material was too expensive and illiteracy was rampant. So Paul would have had a scribe write his letters and he would have signed them. So those original single edition letters would over time with handling break down. And because the teachings of the original apostles were regarded as scripture, they were hand copied and disseminated to other Christian fellowships around the known world. So, while Bible scholars don't agree on where the breaks in the letters should be, I'm going to offer the following based on my study of what Bible scholars think. Letter A, is lost. Letter B is what we know of as 1 Corinthians. Letter C is lost. Letter D is what we know of as 2 Corinthians chapters 1 through 9. And letter E is what we know of as 2 Corinthians chapters 10 to 13. The reason that Bible scholars think that letters a and C originally existed and have been lost is that Paul referred to them in the surviving letters. Now that I've told you that, I want to introduce yet another Greek word to you, and that is adiaphora. Adiaphora is a Greek word that literally means stuff that doesn't matter. And that's what I am telling you about this issue of the five letters. It is enough for you to know that Paul wrote the letters to the Corinthian fellowship on a range of issues, and we have a lot of it. 
And what we have is worthy of our study, but how it is compiled in your Bibles really doesn't matter. Finally, then, to today's installment from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13 to chapter 5, verse 1, and a sermon I have entitled, The Eternal Weight of Glory. Each week, I will go into greater detail about who made up the Corinthian fellowship, but for now, suffice it to say that they were a mixture of Jewish proselytes to Christianity and Gentiles, people who formerly worshipped the many pagan idols of Greece. And each week, I will go into greater detail about who Paul was and what his motivations were that made him the man he was, but for now, suffice it to say that he was a Pharisee, and that Pharisees maintained that there was an afterlife, and that God punished the wicked and rewarded the righteous in the world to come. In this passage, that is our first reading for today, Paul was attempting to encourage the Corinthians, who together may or may not have any concept of the afterlife, that a life of discipleship in Jesus Christ would be worth the effort. Paul wrote and taught that if the Christian lived a life modeled after Jesus's and to a lesser degree after his own, they would not only please God with their godly living, but they would also inherit eternal life. So to the Corinthians, Paul wrote, we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. The we here refers to his partner Timothy as well as the other apostles who together over time are figuring out Christian theology. So what Paul is saying is that whatever teachings or corrections preceded or followed this passage will be worth it because we know that we will be resurrected to live with Jesus. And the we included not only himself, but the other apostles who were firsthand eyewitnesses of Jesus's ministry, passion, death, and resurrection. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Eternal life is the Christian hope that Jesus himself spoke of. It is the reward for a life of discipleship in him. Whatever suffering, self-sacrificing, serving of others that we are led to do by his Holy Spirit will pale in comparison to the glory that awaits us. Paul went on to say that everything including all of his own travels and troubles, his suffering, and even the disrespect of the Corinthians are signs of God's grace. He persevered in his ministry of evangelism so that more people would be exposed to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, so that thanksgiving would increase, and that brings glory to God. Speaking personally now, Going through seminary is an arduous four-year-long task. In my class, there were several who dropped out before graduation. But graduation from seminary is meaningless without ordination. In the Lutheran tradition of the ELCA, a candidate for ministry cannot be ordained without receiving a call to serve a church. Provided that has happened, an ordination is scheduled, and after the vows of ordination are given and answered to, the presider announces that the candidate is now a pastor, and there is usually spontaneous applause. Well, that happened at my ordination, and not being used to that kind of attention. I recall kind of being overwhelmed in the moment and I hid my face in my hands. But then when I collected myself, I faced the applauding congregation and applauded them myself 
because as I understood what was going on, I didn't get there by myself. There were many people along my journey that brought me to that point. Sunday school teachers, vacation Bible school teachers, pastors, Boy Scout leaders, so many people who had brought me to that point. I did not get there on my own. Well, all that to say that what God has done through the Apostle Paul and for our sake is so that more people will hear the gospel and will come to faith in God revealed in Jesus Christ and give thanks to God which in turn gives God glory. Not in this passage, but in other places, Paul wrote that though he suffered miserably and has been persecuted for his work of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, he will not lose heart. He will persevere. He acknowledged that he is just a mortal and his outer nature is wasting away, but he considered that a slight momentary affliction and indeed compared to the eternal weight of glory the trouble we experience in this life is just a slight momentary affliction in expending his outer nature his physical being for the sake of the gospel of jesus christ his inner nature was being fortified if you have followed the leading of the Holy Spirit, then you know what he is talking about. There is an energy that comes back to us when we are useful to God and God's kingdom. This is what he called the what cannot be seen, the things that we do that will pay back in eternal dividends. And he concluded this passage by reminding his readers what he has been taught and that is that all that we know in this temporal life, our bodies and even the earth itself will pass away. The only hope that anyone has is the hope of eternal life with Christ and through Christ. Sisters and brothers in Christ, let us never lose sight of the bigger picture. This life we enjoy right now is just the warm-up act for life eternal. Let us use this time, this life, this mortal body to live lives of discipleship in Jesus Christ, for that brings glory to God. And while we cannot earn our way to eternal life, the reward for a life of faithfulness is what Jesus promised. Let us do all we can to demonstrate our thanks now. Let us pray. Loving and merciful God, we give you thanks for the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul, whose tenacity you used to help spread the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. Let his example inspire us to do all we can do using the gifts you have given us to further your kingdom we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
We have been made God's people through our baptism into Christ, living together in trust and hope we confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us come before the triune God in prayer that all leaders of the church be strengthened for their ministries, that theologians manifest the triune mystery for our time, and that all the baptized be renewed in faith. O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for the church we pray. Holy God, we praise your name. That the earth's mighty water be cleansed, that cedars and oak trees be nurtured, and that wilderness be protected. O God, creator, gardener, and keeper, for the earth we pray. Holy God, we praise your name. That the leaders of nations enact justice for all their people, that prejudice against those of different nationality or color or language cease, and that democracy flourish around the globe. O God, fortress, monarch, and protector, for the nations we pray. Holy God, we praise your name that all people shun the use of violence, and that in remembrance of all the soldiers and civilians who have died in warfare, humankind maintain peace between nations on our streets and in our homes. O oh God, judge, peacemaker, and shield, for peace we pray. Holy God, we praise your name. That the pandemic end, that vaccines be fairly distributed, that the suffering be comforted, that those who are ill be made whole, and, those, and that you visit those on our prayer list, our homebound, and those we now name before you, either silently or aloud. O oh God, healer, comforter, and nurse, for the sick we pray. Holy God, we praise your name. 
that summertime offer refreshment to everyone, that relatives and friends find joy with one another, that travelers be kept safe, and that refugees receive refuge. O God, friend, companion, and homeland, for summertime we pray. Holy God, we praise your name. In remembrance of all who have died in the faith, that with all the saints, at the end of all things, we receive your eternal life. Holy God, we praise your name. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love. Through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now please join in singing our sending hymn.
blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon us now and forever. Amen. You belong here. We belong together. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God.